There are a couple questions up there about alternative uh, sources um, of energy for Louisville, including how to get Kentucky off of our coal addiction, how to address uh, wind, wind turbines as a viable option for uh, Kentucky. I don't know if there we have uh, anybody, if perhaps uh, Lee or uh, Ms. Keller, you can speak to any of those, um, or even tax incentives for using alternative energies. put them too much on the spot there, I don't know. Well, I mean, we all have reduction goals. <laughs> Regina was referring to the Executive Order 13514, I think, didn't name the number, but I think that's what you were talking about. All of us agencies have requirements, and I think we're some of the biggest, what, property owners in the country? I don't know how many buildings we have now, but yeah, GSA. So we're working on it from a federal agency standpoint, and, um, both water conservation and energy conservation. Um, trying to walk the walk and save all of us taxpayers, all of us, <laughs> funding as well as doing the right thing wherever we happen to be. So there are new requirements now about where we site new buildings and when we do major renovations, we have to use green uh, building techniques and uh, look at cons conservation of water and energy. There are quite a few things that the agencies themselves are implementing uh, for the millions of people that work um, to support this in the federal government. Um, there's a database of state incentives for renewable and efficiency. It's called uh, Desire. And the web page is www.dsireusa.org. So there is one source that you can see the types of uh, incentives that are available. Um, I'm also going to get to this question about um, not necessarily, I mean, if if you want to address partisan politics, I don't know if you want to, but um, I don't really. Uh, allocation decisions and how those are made, because there was a point made in the um, previous uh, question area about the census and how important the census is to our community for uh, federal allocations. Um, so when talking about that money coming down, if somebody could just quickly address how that is, um, how that is done. Well, the, the funding that comes through the community development programs is based primarily on census data. Uh, we are looking, as uh, Regina mentioned earlier, at changing the consolidated plan. <coughs> Excuse me. We are also looking at um, changes to the formula because the formula that was developed for the community development block grant program, which serves as a basis for much of the other HUD funding that comes out, was developed in 1974. And so it is time probably to revisit that formula, but that is it is it has to do with population, with with housing stock, with um, out migration, um, percentage of poverty. Those kinds of factors come into play. So for those of you, and it's very timely to mention the census, fill out your census form and get your neighbors to do so. <laughs> One moment. Did, did 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 the congressman want to address that, Brooke? Can he? Oh, he's okay. He's he's back somewhere. Okay. Well, we'll find him. Did you, Mr. Cheatham? Did you want to? Well, I was just going to add, and it's pretty. It's the same as for uh, the other agencies or some of the other agencies in terms of transportation. Yes, the census uh, population counts. It's in the formula for your transportation dollars, and so when they uh, the boundaries in terms of the 2010 census, once it's there what that urbanized area is going, the size of it and the boundaries of it, the population is just one of the components in terms of how much money you get back in terms of federal aid dollars coming back to you. So. All right, we have another question from a uh, non-text participant. Oh, okay. um, climate change means we're going to have a lot of severe uh, weather events. Um, I've experienced uh, my electricity being knocked out for eight days by the windstorm, and then we had the ice storm, which knocked out the electricity for hundreds of thousands of folks in Kentucky. Um, Washington, D.C. has just had a pretty heavy snowstorm. Uh, we have here, I think, the agencies which would be most concerned, um, CDC, Transportation, HUD. Uh, what are you folks doing to help people survive severe climate events in a uh, humane fashion? 
Uh, HUD just finished uh, working with FEMA, and in fact, we'll be working with FEMA to implement um, sustainability elements or to help them implement sustainability elements in their grant uh, programs, their different various grant programs. This would be um, with, the, with, with the goal of addressing um, uh, disaster mitigation uh, and remediation. Um, so I think other agencies, I, I'm pretty sure, will, will sign on to the, the goal uh, that FEMA has established in terms of addressing storm and disaster mitigation relief. I'm sure EPA and I think the Department of Transportation is also on board, and I believe HHS and, and CDC as well. Um, and also, just last week, um, I was in some uh, conferences about disaster, and in HUD's um, recent alloc disaster allocations, part of the funding is being, we are asking the states that receive that, that funding to, to address mitigation, and there are gonna, there's gonna be bonus money available for states that uh, ad creatively address um, mitigation and anticipate uh, development uh, that can be to, so that as disasters may occur, communities and states are more prepared and have developed in a way to, to withstand some of those events. I think you may be um, happy to know that there's a group that's beginning to form around avoidance of some of these things as, as opposed to mitigation. And uh, I've been to one meeting down in my area. There's another one scheduled soon. And it, it was started, I think, by the interest of FEMA uh, for an area. Then I know there are others in other cities, and Lee may talk about one in Iowa. But down in the, in the Georgia area where I happen to, to be at the moment, there are there's a, an area that flooded very badly last September, and in many cases, as you know, it happens around the country this way, it's been flooded several times before. And uh, similar things happen, things get fixed and people get back into their homes, and then two years later it often happens. So what we're doing is, uh, with the Corps of Engineers and the USGS and EPA and FEMA and several other agencies and state organizations talking about what we can do and it really does include this whole set of sustainability principles um, from stormwater problems that come upstream and flow down into the area where a lot of things are happening and all of a sudden you've got uh, floodplains that maybe weren't originally floodplains but we've created you know more typical flooding areas than would have been the case and and so that's something that we're again another type of partnership that the agencies are engaging in to look at this to avoid these problems and I know one of the questions up here says smart growth isn't going to happen until it comes you know like some edict from above I think really it that a lot of people resist that approach but once you see the value of some of these principles in your own neighborhood, in your own city, and understand stormwater issues related to it or uh, parking lots being built and, and all those associated pieces, as well as you know the principles around economics and jobs being there and transportation, I think you start seeing it yourself, you begin to ask for it. And then it's not a, as, hard a, as hard an element to get people to agree on. So in Austell, Georgia, they may be looking at things a little differently in the future than they may have currently or previously been doing. Economic development, economic development. I think we need to look at the other pieces of this along with that in order to have the kind of sustainable communities that you want.